touch a life and change someone. <laughs> is the touch show where touching lives is our business. When most of us hear of Kibira, Kangemi, Kawangware, Korogosho, Mkuru, Kwanjenga, name them, the first thing that comes to mind is slums or what has come to be known as informal settlement. But believe it or not, many people of very high status and successful careers have been born and bred in such places. Today, here on the Touch Show, we will be celebrating a few of our own who have been brought up in such environment but have risen and made it to stardom. I am your host, Noela Musundi. Welcome. Touch a life and change a slum or ghetto as defined by United Nations is a rundown area of a city characterized by substandard housing and squalid living conditions. In Kenya, there are more than five ghettos and more than a million people live here. However, when the name ghetto is mentioned, Kibera and Madare Valley is what comes to mind. The people living here survive on less than a dollar a day. As a result, many talented youths develop inferiority complex because of the stigma that comes with living here. In spite of this, there are those who have their origins in the ghetto, yet the sky has never been the limit. They have learned to use their experiences to make them unique, and as a result, they have become ghetto role models. Born and bred in Kibira, the famous Octopizo was orphaned at the age of 15. You can imagine how tough life was at that age. He was forced to drop out of school in order to fend for his younger siblings. Now 24, Octopizo has achieved much more than most people at his age. Take a look at this. Waving the Kenyan rough flag high within and without the nation, Henry Ohanga, popularly known as Octopizo, has his origins in Kibera. Kibera is my home. Kibera is everything. Kibera is why I rap. Kibera is where, why I do what I do today. If, uh, if I was born in some areas, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing today. So Kibera is the number one inspiration. His inspiration that he gets from his experiences in the hood forms the backbone of his song. So I wanted to bring that picture that Kibera, Kibera can do what you guys can't do. Kibera got swag. Kibera, people like Chokora. You know, we can dress, we, we, go to, we went to school. There's a day I went somewhere and, and they're asking me, do people from Kibera talk English? And I was just like, I, I, I don't know, maybe you come and see. While in high school, Okto lost his parents, and so he had to fend for his younger siblings. I did everything that girls do and men do, because I was the first one, and my mom wasn't soft at all. I went, I, I washed clothes, I went to get mboga, like I did everything that chicks do. I can cook. I can cook any food. Like. Though he had a daunting task of ensuring everything is available for the family at a young age, he never lost hope. Yeah, I didn't take it bad. I take it like, like you know, something that can't kill you just make you stronger. So me, I took it. I, I took it hard. I took it by the horns and. I don't like talking about it because I just want to go strong. I want to prove to people like, you know, being an orphan is not something to take advantage or cry of. You know, it's something like you, you, you should change it and, and make people look at the orphans differently. Currently staying in one of the prestigious estates in Nairobi, Okto tries to give back to the society whenever he gets the chance to. We have a, a center where people like train 
dancers come and train and there's a timetable for every category. Can't speak of this dancing group they train there. We have two dancing group, we have many rappers, we have graffiti artists and we have graphic artists. So we just all we were doing in the slum is just when when there is concerts and when there is like Kunama concert in Dogondogo, we're going to choose the best in every category. Then we tell them, look, we have a group like this as an artist. We can come together and every show we go, we go together. All we, uh, uh, we like, what I can say is that it keeps them away from who are lazy, na who are ignorant. Yani. There's somewhere they can always go and do something. His parting shot to the youth. No shortcut by the way. There's no shortcut to success. Everybody must work hard. Hard work, no shortcut. We stay focused, keep away in a bit to the Nazikusu. Big hand for our lovely Octo Pizzo. Karibu sana to the third show. Thank you. Na congratulations, you know you're doing so well. My heat, kwachilia mahewa. We celebrate you today sana. Thanks, thanks. Lakini sasa ui Octo Pizzo ni nani? Okay, Octo Pizzo ni boy wa mta. Nimeboniwa na nika guro mta ni kibichi na mbanane. So... Basically, jina octo ili come up in, you know, octo in mathematics, you know, means eight, yani. So, octo in math means eight. Alafu, ma tatu za kibera, ukichukua pale railways, zina kwa ganamba eight za kuenda kibera. So, basically, octo piso is kibera. Then, uh, Nairobi, Nairobi tuko na eight districts. So, octo piso ni Nairobi. Then, originally, yani, Kenya, we had eight provinces. Wachana na hizi za China zenye zime come. <laughs> so, Niki wa Nairobi, me represent Kibera sana. When but Niki and Malika Coast, na represent Kibera na Nairobi at the same time. But Niki toka in Kenya to the diaspora, now na represent Kibera, Nairobi, Kenya. But Kibera comes first. How was life growing up in Kibera? Unajua tuwenga na sikianga, eh, mtawa, wanadani uh, uh, ni, mashida nini, ebu tuambie, having... Uh, shida, shida zilikuwepo, but unajua, there's always the best side and the bad side of the hood. So... The, and kubonga about the best side of it, ju, ju the, 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 the negative side of it inafa tuna embrace alafu ndo ina kumek. So the best side of it ni kuwa yani, if you can make it in any gate yani unaweza make kila mahali. Uki, ukitupo leo kwa desert utakuwa na ujanja yani ya kulivu kwa yo desert. Au tanza kulia lia yani. So unagrow kama ujezo ya kulia lia, unagrow, we grow like you're so ahead of your time. Take, uh, una, yani, una kuwa older faster. Tuse mwana za kuwa 10, lakini even yona think, una think kama siya kuwa 20. But so. the bad side is that, yani, as much as we love, I love or we love Kibera, yani, we don't like it. We don't like the kind of life, you know, tunaishi pali hivyo, unajua. Watu wenge wajai jua, ukiwa Kibera, unadhani, this is the real life, yani, kila mse inafaishi. But as soon as unatoka out of Kibera, yani, ama ugo somewhere, ama ugo hata kuna beshti yako mgini babi, don't know God, at least, yani sisi hata, we are not living, nobody lives in the ghetto, everybody survive. Na sasa umehama, ulihama, ama? Mm, I think, I think both. Mm. Like, like, you know, I, I can never forget where I come from. Kedzangu ya mta bado yiko, tuna, bado niko na familia hood, na nakuwa gaud daily, because ina depend, pia kuna, kuna ngoma zene ni kita kuandika inspirational, inafani go home ya yani, nigo kibera nika home nika nimeenda hote sasa ni napata hiyo inspiration life yani kitu kila kitu iko alive so nikitaka ku address my issues of poverty i don't fake it si semi ati ndakuwa na kama lika love alafu na jaribu ku address poverty i make sense so naenda pale naona naandika kitu yenye iko so but yeah nili move you are offered at the age of 15 yep how tough was that you know 15 years alafu mandugu zako dada zako you have to be the Father, you had to be the mother. Yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy tough. I look form two by then. Then I uh, yeah, nili have to rudio cha kiasi. Then when I just asking any family, when I join a kwangali yaga, when I who who when I make grow ghetto, who ni muizi, I'm a yovuta, yovuta ndom. Then when I watch that, I rudi. Then to kanza biashara zingine za mbaya mbaya, then I just mention. 
but then uh, fortunately kuna mse flani mlami flani alikuwa anajua madhe yangu alikuwa na do ki microfinance in the hood which ni kibao so ali 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 ni call akaniambia atanilipia the form for ni niende ni malize tu ni malize form for then hapo tu ndo anaweza support so pia mimi nikarudi nilikuwa nilikuwa chuo flani hapo mtane tu kibera glory ilikuwa hapo line saba so mi chuo zangu zote nimeenda mtani primary nenda mashimoni primary mtani alafu form four nikamaliza hapo hivyo glory but then sasa hizo sana kwa na live na na kuzo wangu flani alikuwa na stay huko seti so nilikuwa natoka seti na ingia hivyo mpaka nikamada fourth saa kumada fourth ndo saa ikakuwa hata guan sana kwa crazy jo sasa wajo kwa ga form four unatamani unata sana kumaliza shule lakini ukimaliza ndo unaona hata fadhali urudi sasa repeat yani kwanza hivi hata wase lunch box zao but so mimi um, nilikumotivate kwa hizi like you know all these things are happening mimi nilikuwa na at least kupe your strength to just you know wake up to a new day na unasema unajua nini ah uh, hii maisha hapa kanitoboy eh sana sana za sema ni mabro ma zangu na masiz yani mi mi mimi nimekuwa ga dreamer sana yani sitakagi sitaki na naona ga Kenya budango ali do sitaki kudu hiyo nataka kuwa better hata kama alikuwa kata kwa kali kwa na ndai mimi nataka na kwa ndai kubwa unachoe kikali kwa na keza ndogo mimi nataka kwa na keza kubwa and uh, so hiyo ndio kitu ni motivate sana nikiona mabro zangu yani atukua tu uh, atukua tumeonana for the last seven years like together kila kuna sisi yangu alikuwa na stay na uncle wangu obrangu mwingine stay na aunt yangu mimi na stay kivi yangu mimi sikutai na mseo tena nenda kustay na best yangu na tulikuwa na high school alikuwa anatoa jackson kalush is one of the best is my hero yani alinikaribisha kwa kedzao hakuwa na kedza so alikuwa naishi na kwa kedzao na familia yao for for like one year and by then kuna aunt yangu fulani alikuwa amenilipia hapa inda nilikuwa na do wiring nilikuwa nasomea kiwaya waya hivi so nilikuwa gamsema wiring kileta ndai yako tunakundia which i still do and i love it so eh na shukuru aunt yangu for that so nika do wiring from like uh, 2 to 8 since to wait nikona do wiring in da somewhere in baricho road then uh, later kukakuja 209 kulikuwa na sensors na pia mimi sikuanguka sana mtiani so nika apply hiyo ki sensors nikaangukia ku count wa same tani nika count wa say alafu hizo don lipata kwa ku count wa say nikaenda nika nika invest kwa music so by that time nilikuwa tuna freestyle yani nilikuwa na do too hip hop yani as a fan si ati nilikuwa nataka ati sikuwa na sikuwa na hiyo intention yani itakuwa kuza big i was just trying it cuz niliona inda yani ulikuwa unapata kwa wiki unapata ruabe so ki kwa in a week you have 200 bob alafu that 209 mtu yango alikuwa anazaliwa so ilikuwa crazy yani my first born alikuwa anazaliwa so ili bidi ni hustle mara 1000 so any anything yani anything it comes kwa nachagua job Twinga uh-huh. naangalia anga mtaa unajua kibira kina kangemi kaangwari anasema ah hawa watu wa mtaani ni shida shida watu yeah. kupika popote mm-hmm. kini waktopizo from kibich sai uko hapa ni nini as in ni nini ungependa kusema juu ya hiyo notion yenye watu wako nayo eh uh, kana nzambia aseani usay give usay give up usay give up na no say look back kama umetoka hiyo nafai ku mold na yani usiye usiye kwa msa kulialia pia sana na kungoja watu wa kufanyia vitu alafu life ni short sana take opportunities opportunity yenye utaget to say la la darasani kwa na toka mtaa yani mtaa yote mimi na, na, na consider gaul ghettos are the same ni venye sawa wewe venye ume, umeji package usijiachilia tu jiona toka kibera na fantembe na trawe meraruka ndo ni prove yatu na toka kibera unajua kibera is not is not what people think it is yani It's just a normal place when you kill them since I grow up lakini sa ni venye umejiweka ghetto is in the mind uh, so ukisema okay ka ghetto yako kwa mwili then utakuwa unajiumiza alafu kuna msa atakuchukua serious so, unaweza imagine ningekuja hapa hivi na mainzi ungekuwa mmekimbia hapa sana <laughs> that's also ju umepitia hii maisha yote is there anything you're doing maybe to just give back to the community maybe kibira ma ku just inspire watu wengine wenye sahi wako kwa maisha that you used to live before what are you doing yeah, yeah i have a couple of things ka kuna sahi tulianza around 209 uh, nilikuwa na wakaza youth ambassador so nilitulii nilform up ka group 
ya ma artist mtaani tuna deal na wase serious you know uwezi change kila mse mtaani kuna wase wengine ignorant watakagi kuchangiwa au ni kukabeza na kukontisha ya macho tuna group inetu wa YGB is composed of rappers graffiti artists singers and dancers so ni wale watu yani wa ghetto yenye mse haizi enda chuo ba tunajua na ka talent tunajua talent siki tunenda ga chuo kusomea so tuna tuna organize gima small talent search pale mtaani alafu tunachukua the best alafu sasa nikienda show mimi nikienda show inakuwa kama au sasa ni walk over yao they should not go through what i went through niki try to get my show niki fight na wase yani ndio ati upate stage sasa hii au wana ni climb inafaa chukue advantage ya kuni climb nikienda show yote wako hapo wana perform ndio mimi perform so msio hata kinita show hiyo anakuwa gana in mind ndio the first thing niko na madansa wangu wanaweza perform kama wezi si do cuz that's the only way i think i can give back to the community by support our to hii na wasi unajua kukua upcoming artist na kugrow up hivyo is crazy yani ni hard sana alafu again niko na niko na kampuni yangu kiasi si kiasi sana is a little bit big inaitwa chocolate city tours ambapo mimi upatia walami yani wazungu tour ya mtaa unajua kibera si ni masimba wanakuja kutuona ma kuna mataiga kuna waseni wanakafani fani yani. <laughs> but uh, tuna tunaleta gatu wale the on the positive side of kibera unajua kila time ukisikia kibera ni wale wasio kungoa reli na ni wale wasio wamesota yenye ni waizi kucheka eh, and hiv and stuff but sasa kuna hiyo iko kuna that part of it but it's just 2% ajo kuna the 98% of kibera which is so positive na we mwenyewe as in to date are you embarrassed ama you proud uh, you love I'm, kibera na wezi feature i'm never embarrassed because mm. kibera made me who i am today ni kwa very sure ninge fake it ningeza kusema na tukalangata singe kuata hapa sai so the fact that me mention your kibera i mean it may take places may take places sana so you know reason ni list at ki chocolate city so what we do tuko na wasemi wa employee hapo kiasi kuna tour guides na security guides na tu watupatia gima karau job unajua uko mtani kuna wasa wanaogopewa ni ma bad boy unaenda na haya huyo bad boy unamfuatia job ya security so kuna venye atakuibia na umempea job na first of all una inspire so ana nakumbe hiyo bad boy yangu pia inaweza nilisha lakini on a positive note si lazima nipige msenge another thing you can't change somebody when you're in the same environment Sasa ti mimi naishi hapa hapa hivi ini keza yangu na ini keza best yangu na naomba gawema zesu work hard jo hame na we ni jirani work hard jo hame so unajua juu tulienda na umsechu wa moja maybe hata alipas kuliliko ama nilipas kumliko ina fami ndo ni work hard alafu ni toke one eh something is happening yani hapa hivi akujanilize kwani wewe do other ndo katuka ukatokelezea so pia mi namwambia kinaenda ga hivi alafu unaenda hivi nenda kata ni ameni kwa geto na shambangu uko na ivasha na kuja tu Nairobi kugotea watu kabisa uh, juu yani you stay kupitia sakile mtoi wangu apitia ile life yenye mimi nilipitia yani juu si fan alafu history si poa ikijirepeat waza inafa yani siku moja nikiwashoshona ama shosho yake ama mi babu yao namwambia jo tuko na toka place flani inaitwa chocolate city yani uko na storyline si ati budango alizaliwa hapo gukangu mimi naye hapo sasa unajua unaambia ga mtu huyu akuliza nipigie story unaambia ai tuko tunaishi pale juu tukahamia pale down mtaka uko naishi pale so unapata hata story bambi aina aina storyline sawa sawa kutopizo kabla uende acha tuchukue tu maswali machache from the audience my name is frida Ajuma, I come from Kampala International University and I'd like to ask a musician Dr. Pizzo just one question. As a parent and a musician, how do you manage to balance between your family and your music? One thing, yani, my family comes first in everything. <laughs> it, it always comes first cuz uh, I was I was I was, I was, grow, I was I was brought up in like a very very like spiritual family and we value family so much so i'm only octopizo when i'm when i'm on the stage when i'm at home nikifika kwa mlango kuna cha octopizo octopizo libaki huko so when i get home I, i i play with my daughter i take my daughter to school and i pick her up and uh, i cook i do everything yani 
So that's how I deal with it. Okay, Octopizo, thank you so much. Thank you. For sharing your story. <laughs> All the best. My next guest, now a very famous radio presenter in Kenya, started off selling soup in Korogosho where he was born and raised. Before learning his job as a, as a radio presenter at Ghetto Radio, Gidinji Mwangi aka Mbusi had his own share of odd jobs, but which he believes has made him be who he is today. We'll be talking to him shortly, but first, take a look. Every afternoon on weekdays, Ghetto Radio is jammed with calls and listeners tuned in to listen to Gidinji Mwangi, a.k.a. Mbusi. Yes, sir. His popularity did not just come in a fortnight. He struggled to be where he is. Born in Korogosho, Mbusi was at some point in life forced to be a drug peddler and did odd jobs to make both ends meet. His strong desire to be the best in everything he does uplifted his spirit and each day Mbusi ensures that he learns something new. Though he has moved out of Korogosho, he has never forgotten where he came from. With his inspiration to soldier on in life, being drawn from his family, he is first to admit that his daughter Stacy lightens up his day. Sana kwa kwa kwa. Na sisi leo, yes, it's actually sir. an honor to have you. Kavisa. Mbusi, Gidinji Mwangi, ni nani? Nilizali watu mutani, korokocho, mutani ya mama na baba, maali mutoi ya kira ukasubui hivi, kitu wanaona ya kwanza ni mutaro. Nafsi unajua tu mashida shida hivi, nikalele watu poa, lakini na mashida za hapa na pale, Mzai yaku atina ile nguvu sana. So nilichop, nikachop kiasi mbaka class 8. Akafanikiwa kidogo, nikaenda mbaka form 4 hapa isili. Lakini saa after form 4, yuni na makole miu ziona nikipita kwa baru. So, <laughs> lakini nikaridhika, na nashukuru ungidadi sana mali ya linifikisha kimasomo nini, miu bambika. So after chuo, Ndiyo hizo mahasling sasa zikaanza. Real life. Njiwa mtu wakiwa chuo ee uambiwa. Kijana soma maisha ni ngumu. Unaona nikaa utani. So after kutoka chuo sasa. Ndiyo nikaanza mahasling nini. Mutani na maboy. Unaona tu life ni hizi jubado ujaanza. Kini ikafika sasa ile time. Mzaewa na mother wameenda ocha. Lani mebaki sasa. Nika ni kwa one man, nini masiste. Lafuza kwetu ni masafara. Hakuna mtu wana kitu. Tunaangalia nanga, tuku angaliana. So ikabidi sasa, kuna mzae alikuwa na uzanga 
supu hapo mtaani hapo ndio nilidoea kwanza masupu mbili tatu nikafundisha unajua ile kwanza ku, kupiga supu ni, ni hesabu lazima utumie brain oh, si kuchemsha tu si ati kuchemsha tu ama nini hapo kwanza mtihani ni pale kwa kupiga hata nashinda ngo hizi masozi zangu kwa nini hazikutokea na hiyo jo kili <laughs> ikakuwa fiti nikaona pia sasa hii supu the more na yuza watu uh, na hit, yani mahitaji the more na grow the more mahitaji zinakuwa mob nikaona sasa kuishi mahali moja unaweza ishi mahali moja ukuwe zuzu lazima utoke kaona sasa nitoke coach ni at least mtaa kiasi so at some point will hama kutoka coach si kuhama yeah. niko tu mtaani ah. ni kazi tu na hana hana ah. eh, narudi mtaani majioni so nilikuwa nikaanza kukama hapa theater pa national theater nikakaa saa hiyo sijui mtu nakaa tu pale juu ya mawe naona tu watu wakipita ujui ni nani ndio nani but the time ni kukaka hapo nikaanza kujuana na watu ndio nilipata nanga na jamaa fulani anaitwa robo uh, yeye ni presenter get ready kwanza nilitoka anga mbio ingine vile alikuja juu anakaani ka karao kajua sasa leo nimepato eh, na mambo ya magendo eh, eh. <laughs> Eh hey, kumbe ni job ina come. Na hiyo ilikuwa wakati mgani? Ilikuwa ni sana ni 208. 208 mafeb hapo. Sasa hiyo ndiyo get ready ilikuwa inaenda kuanza. Sasa jamaa kani interview kidogo hapo, nikaangukia ka job ka com- comedy hapo get ready. Sasa ile show nilipewa ilikuwa ni ya asubuhi. But nilikuwa tu naleta traffic updates na accent ya karao kini karao mujanja ule anaongea sheng mimi nikitukaa hiyo nikachapa chapa hiyo job kitukaa miezi sita sasa afta kuchapa chapa kukatokea tu mambrcha zingine ikasemekana oh sijui nini hata una sauti ya radio we ufai kuwa presenter sasa we ile job tunaweza kupea labda ya messenger so katoka from comedy to messenger eh hey, wakani demote kutoka presenter wakaniweka messenger lakini nikakubali kachapa hiyo messenger nilichapa uh, two and a half years hapo tu get ready kachapa watu wana kama presenter mtu amewacha chips pale chini no kuna messenger huko kwa balcony na kama ananituma mimi nateremkia teketeke tu akisikia mafegi mimi ndio naendea hivyo nikangangana tu sasa nilikuwa na sinik pale kwa studio kiasi. Kuna mtu wangu anaitwa D. Sasa D alikuwa anaona niko na hiyo potential ni vile nimekaziwa. Ana ni sinik pale kwa studio. Mi na Kemba tu vile anafanya mambo na jiangalilia. Natamani tu nasema kuile nitajapata chance nyingi. <laughs> Alikangangana ndio sasa after kitu kama hiyo tu and a half of years eh, ile management ya ghetto radio ika change kwa kuwa wale masonko walikuwa wame wameinua saa kutoka hapo ule jamaa alikuwa anaitwa D ndiye alikuwa na host hiyo show inaitwa Goteana saa yeye akapromotiwa akakuwa mbigi wa maproducer nini sana mimi kama messenger nikaambiwa jaribu hapo sasa na ile umessenger yangu nikajua hasa hapa ndiyo kutoa umessenger kabi. <laughs> nikangangana tu nikangangana siku ya kwanza nilikuwa natetemeka hata ukinisikia kwa mic tu yo huyo jamaa anatetemeka kangangana saa jana yeye akakaa mpaka sasa hapo niko mm-hmm. eh. na maisha yamebadilikaje sasa we mbusi unajulikana very famous life life iko poa iko poa juu kumbuka nikiwa coach kuna place singe wai singe wai fika hata nikiwaacha coach nikiwa tu kwa hiyo messenger hapo tu get ready kuna mahali watu walikuwa wanaenda no mi singeenda lakini unaona saa hii naweza enda naweza come ni bonge na toto is kama wewe maybe maybe singe wai kutana na mtu kaa unaona so naona iko poa 
Yani Nam... life ime change kabisa pande yangu wewe. Na mtaa bado uko coach au umehama mambo ikoje? Ah uh, mtaa ni, nime nimetoka. Nimetoka lakini si si ati nimetoka ile kabisa. Niko tu hapo karibu na mtaa. Lakini saa hii niko mahali juu sasa naona ghetto pale ti. Eh niko eh at least naikemba pale lakini lazima nifike mtaa korokocho. Huko ndiyo mi upata sheng zangu kutembea hizi mageto kibra kama hii ya uh, kina oktopizo hivi eh, huko na pita pita machuo mbili tatu. Tuna holidolio na watu mbili tatu hapo alafu napata hizo mashenga. Na ukipitia hizi mashida zote from no police inspector to mm -hmm. messenger and all that. Kuna wakati flani ulifeel kama eh hey, hii mashenga imechoka ni kugive up. Eh hey, ilifika mahali. Saa ikakuwa, unajua kuna kitu hata, hata kaa ni sonko wako, anaeza kuambia usikie hii na ayo, hame kudunga dungi dungi. Udaona tu, afadhali sasa ikae. Ilifika point, kafika sasa, ni, ilikuwa nika, nimetumua maali. Nikiwa tu messenger, sasa niyo nika, nika kugive up. Nimetumua WST, nitoke WST niende banana. Nitoke banana ni rudi niende buru. Nitoke buru ni rudi ngara. Sasa kwa studio. Na nimepewa mia. Ndiyo fea. Nikaenda sasa nikamua sasa hapa juu hii mia. Sina kitu kwa nyumba. Tabidi nipike kaguu hizi tuwa zote. Nibakina hii sotu kamange na toto isu wakua. Sasa nilipiga lapu. Kurudi na rudi studio six jio. E, nime beat, nime choka. Ule jamaa ile kitu ananiambia yaani. Ananiuliza vitu zingine. Nikaona tu sasa hii. Imekuja sana. Juu sasa kuniambia ti. Sasa wewe nimeona tuwezi fanya kazi na wewe tena. Kama kuenda tu hapa banana na hapa Westland. Unatumia wanu, mchana mzima. Kujia resignation yako wa mande. Ilikuwa Thursday na kumbukanga sana. Sasa hiyo Thursday kuniambia ni kujie resignation Monday. Friday ndiyo hao sijui ni skando iliwapata ama kulienda nini. Au ndiyo wakariza inio Friday. <laughs> Sasa <laughs> wakapona. <laughs> Waliriza inio Friday. Mi kukuja Monday ya tinakujia ni ni resignation. Na ambuwa we kijana jaribu hii show uone kama inaeza. Hapo ndiyo niliangukia job. Nikasema ni... Saja. Anda kabisa. E. Na watu wengi ya mshu ino korogosho waki kuona hivi. Mm -hmm. Ata saa zingine watu wengine saa hii wako na wana shuku. It's like, ah, huyu hata fika bali, ah, metoka korogosho. Kari mm -hmm. yake itai, uu na wazaji juwe hiyo jambo. Usiwa idharao kitu. Wacha niseme kitu juu. E. Usiwa idharao kitu. Ama uone mtu uone haka nika kitu. Usidharau mtu kama ujajua ni nini anaweza fanya. Wale wanaweza ona nikaa tu watu wa ghetto hawawezi enda mbali. Wanaambiwa ngotu waangalie. Hata hapo ghetto radio walikuwa tu wananikemba wanashindo sasa huu ni nani. Singe kulania na mtu ghetto radio. Juwao ni masos. Mi ni niwaletea wakule. Alafu mi ni pige chuo mpale tsunami. Nipige suna yangu hapo katakata, katakata ni chapati na pigu wa msala ba alafu kasupu juu. Iyo unafinya unarudi studi hivyo. Lakini usiwai, usiwai darau mtu. Angalia mtu mpe chance, patia mtu chance, ajiprove. Akijiprove sasa, akishindo unaeza kituka hiyo. Na usi darau mtu. Na sasa hivi yeah. tuseme mbusi yani wangukie tena ni ukue sonko sonko mm -hmm. vibaya mm -hmm. nini utafanya kusaidia watu tuseme korogosho na hizo slabs zingine ili mm -hmm. kuapa tu opportunity pia eh wakuwe na ile voice yani ukisimama okay, mbele watu eh. na ile you know unajiamini eh, eh tiari, tiari ni kaa nishaanza juu niko na production yangu nime nimeanzisha inaitwa hakuna mbr entertainment Sasa hiyo hakuna mbre entertainment. Ni wale maboy wako mtaani. Maybe wewe ni DJ. Ujawai pata chance. Maybe wewe ni musician. Ujawai pata chance. Maybe wewe ni comedian. 
hiyo ni hakuna mbere entertainment kuja tuchapiane nini tuone vile tunaweza kutoa chini ukiangalia mtu kama bonokode bonokode ni safara tu wa Mungu tunajaribu kumtoa pale tumulete tumtoe ile mentality ya uchokosh tumuweke ile mentality ya ya kilion aanze kuha, kuhanga hiyo design yani ukipata chance uk, Mungu akikubariki vuta mmoja ukiweza kuvuta wawili wavute au wawili nao watavuta wawili au wengine watavuta wawili tujipate korokocho mzima tumevutana tumetoka eh sawa sawa mbusi asante mm -hmm. sana kini kabla uondoke acha yes, tuchukue maswali kadhaa kutoka ah. kwa mafans wako <laughs> swali langu ni kwamba kufikia penye umefika zile changamoto ambazo umepitia katika hiyo kariya yako sasa ni mipangilio gani unafanya kuna kwamba hata ukitoka geto ready unaweza kupata mahali pengine ambapo watakuchukua bila wasiwasi wote uh, kitu ya kwanza asanti kwa hiyo swali na kuna kitu inaitango wa mama mzazi na mama mzazi uwezi lelewa na mama yako saa hii ukifika 8 years ati ume, una, umeanza kutoka nyumbani nasema sasa huu mama hata ukitumwa sukari uwezi endea ukitumwa kitu na mama uwezi endea kitu ya kwanza unaangalia mama mahali amekutoa mahali amekufikisha juu unaweza kuwa yes utaitwa mahali pengine ukiitwa hapo pale pengine maybe wanataka kuangusha hii pande ingine ikishaanguka na wewe sasa wakuangushe so unaangalia pande zote mbili. So lazima kwanza ni nikae tu hapo nifike ile level na jua hata nikitoka niende hata nikose mahali pengine ama nipate mahali pengine nipa, nipafanye tu siku mbili ama tatu hata nikianguka niko tu set. Sitarudi down, sitarudi yani korokocho. You inspire me a lot. Na sijai jua nitakuja kukuona kasi ingekuja isho leo. Uh, sasa lengo ni inachoka kujua ile samo inakufanya uko hapo yani kitu inakupush as in towards that new career that you have ju pia mimi nataka kuwa penye uko and i want to be better maybe better than you lakini nataka kujua kitu nyo na wewe inakupush hadi unafanya kinyo ufanya ah uh, kitu kitu thanks thanks kitu inanifanya ni kuwe na bidii ni kajuni ya kangu kanaitwa Stacy Mber Ako ako ka junior siwezi yenyewe siwezi takaka kuwe na life yenye mimi nimepitia yenyewe budangu mwenyewe najua anaweza kuwa proud sana last born wake ndiye amesaidia familia na get saa wananipea hiyo wananipea hiyo hope hiyo kuwa na hiyo bd ya kuhaso mpaka nifike mahali niko. Jumi uweka familia mbele. Juu kwa hii life kuna kuanga na sako hivi. Hii sako iko na family na iko na right man. Hii ni sako ni ya before film. After film kuna sako ingine. Kuna ya family, right man na mambo cha wengine wamekuja. Kwa hii sako. So angalia hao watu wanakamu utaona after kudunda after urudi chini utabaki tu na ile sako ya kwanza ile family na right man so angalia family na right man kwanza sikia advice zao nini au ndio wananipeanga hiyo hope eh, juu siwezi takati after nimeenda hivi after kudunda huyu family na huyu right man wanaanza kuniambia situlikwambia kwako wapi na get sasa familia nini au ndio wananipea hiyo hope yes, maybe sir. just parting shot kidogo kwa my youth alafu mm -hmm. after hapo since when ni presenter kama mimi mimi nataka wewe u sign out hii interview leo lakini baada ya uh, ki advice hivi ah uh, kabisa advice kwa matoto is msianike nanga ovi ovi muta beat <laughs> muta chapa kwa my boys no gangs to town Tafadhali sana you can shoot your own sister your own mother your own brother no gangs to town yes saya aya na ya safara bua fa ya gonta ya kuoma ya akuma kuomi na di babylon de makuomi na dar
Rasta mana bro, aku na berca. May the grace of our show go tiana, and the love of Brucey, and the fellowship of the ghetto family be with us now and for forevermore. Lazima. <laughs> <laughs> Big hand uh, for Busi. <laughs> A lot of us must have heard of the Bonoko conversation and heat. But what we don't know is that the guy behind it, famously known as Tete, started off as a street kid facing a million challenges. At the moment, he co-hosts with Mbusi at Ghetto Radio, doing much more at the same time. Take a look. With a greater part of his life spent on the streets, James Kangede, a.k.a. Bonoko, never thought that he would come out of the streets. Now working at Ghetto Radio as a co-host Tumbusi, he admits that life has taken a drastic change. For now, he is dedicated to help other street children come out of the streets through their show. Room and sad it may look, it's never the end of the road. You can achieve much more with a positive perspective and hard work than you even ever imagined. My guest today, Okto Pizo Mbusi, many thanks for being with us. My studio audience, Kampala International University and the University of Nairobi, Asante Sana, and also you at home, always keep in touch. And of course, our DJ Rafkat. I was your host, Noela Msundi. Until next time, same place, same time. Brrr, cha, saja bless. <laughs>
is the third show where touching lives is our core business. Incidences of cancer are rapidly increasing with over 82,000 new cases reported every year here in Kenya. Prostate cancer alone accounts for up to 18,000 deaths annually, 60% who die at the most productive years of their lives. With these statistics in mind, prostate cancer is the third leading cause of cancer. I am your host, Noella Musundi. Welcome to the third show. Let me say something about cancer. The prostate cancer situation in Africa is currently alarming, yet the general public has very little knowledge about it. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. I just know it's a disease for women on the titties. Yeah, prostate cancer is um, the cancer of the lungs, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything. I don't know. Yeah, I've had that with Anyangyong, Professor. Okay, I know it's caused by excessive smoking, if I'm not sure. Yeah, that's all I know about it. It affects the, it, it infects the male. I don't know what causes that prostate cancer, but I know it's a cancer which affects mostly men. Prostate cancer is the abnormal growth of cells in the prostate. The cancerous cells multiply and invade the prostate, and this can lead to death. When not diagnosed early, it spreads to other organs of the body. This disease is curable through surgery, and prominent personalities like Nelson Mandela, Bishop Desmond Tutu, former United States of America Secretary of State Collins Powell, just to mention a few, have overcome it. No one knows the exact cause of prostate cancer, but studies have found some risk factors. Most of us take our life and health for granted. Routine checkups and symptoms are often ignored, leading to late diagnoses and dire consequences. Jerry Okungu, one man, knows this fact too well. He is here to share his story with us. But first, as always, let's take a look at this. Touch your life and change someone. Any news coming from a doctor is always waited upon with a lot of anxiety and worry, sometimes hope. For Jerry Okungu, his lead surgeon was brutally honest with him from the first time they met. My reaction to the news was uh, shock and devastation. I was completely confused. I didn't know what to say or what to do. This came at the peak of his life. He never thought that at any time he would be diagnosed with such a serious condition. Life was very exciting before the cancer. I was a very busy man. I was traveling quite a bit. I was working. Uh, one, as a consultant uh, with many, very many organizations. I was active as a writer. I write many articles for different you know, newspapers, both in Kenya and outside Kenya. So that was basically my life. My life was very busy. So after cancer came in, I was grounded. During this time, Jerry lost more than 60 pounds. However, this did not kill his dream of staying alive. Cancer treatment depends on individual DNA. I may have the same cancer like you, you do, but the way you react to the medicine and the way my body reacts to the medicine are totally different because they are controlled by our individual unique DNA composition. So the doctor did not tell me that I was going to die in two years or three years or one month or something like that. No, the doctor didn't say. As long as I was responding to the medicine, that is the news that they want to hear, you know, that kind of thing. Through it all, he had his family and friends support, which has provided him with the strength to move on. I know I have, I have cancer, but I also know that I need to live a, bit, a little bit longer at least for my children, uh, family, or for 
or my friends who have stood by me all this time. I need to, that's the only way to give them back by tr- also doing my best to live longer than I should have le- lived. But more importantly, so that I have time to also tell people about this thing. This diagnosis has not kept Jerry down. He understands the situation and has decided to give back to the community the best way he knows how. And true to his word, the Jerry Forum was born. So right now, if you anything that you want to know about prostate cancer, if you if you click www.jerryokungu.org, you will get to this website. And when you get to this website, you will see many 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 stories. You will see many many research results. You will see many many drugs which are coming out, which are you know going to be in the market for the treatment of cancer. I love you. Touch your life and change someone. Jerry, karibu sana. Welcome so much Thank to the Tad Show. Thank you. At what point did you discover that you had prostate cancer? Well, I discovered about uh, my prostate cancer around May, uh, May, May this year. I'd been sick for quite a bit of time. I'd been uh, treated by a number of doctors. Uh, the difference was that I had been misdiagnosed and therefore most of the treatment that I was being given for about three to four months had nothing to do with cancer until I chose to look for a second opinion. And that's when one doctor correctly found out that I had cancer. Uh, and Jerry, the point you discovered you mm-hmm. had prostate cancer, mm-hmm. what ran through your mind? How did you receive the news? Yes, uh, many things went through my mind. I, I was shocked. I was very devastated. Uh, I didn't know much about cancer, leave alone prostate cancer. I had never read about it. I would never thought about it. Uh, I had never imagined that I would have cancer. And uh, when the doctor told me that my cancer was very advanced, that was even much more, you know, you know, worrying for me because uh, when people hear that you have advanced cancer, uh, it means uh, you are actually dying. That is what it, it, it meant. So the first thing I thought about was uh, how do I break this news? my family, uh, my friends, and relatives. Uh, the doctor really wanted to admit me after uh, some, you know, examining me and told me, look, you need very urgent attention. And uh, she wanted to admit me at Aga Khan. I said, no, you cannot do that because uh, this is a very serious matter. I have to go back home. I have to go and talk to my family, break the news to them, and uh, we will take a joint decision on what to do next. But it was a very <laughs> trying moment for me, yes. I can imagine. Yes, yes. Uh, and what were your symptoms? See, the, 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 the danger with the prostate cancer particularly, at least that's the one I, I, I have experience in, is that it's a silent killer. It can be with you for a very long time without you knowing about it. Uh, finally, when I was now diagnosed, uh, the, the doctor told me I might have had it for about two years. And uh, the first maybe one and a half years, there were no signs that I had cancer. But the last three months or four months, I started seeing signs that I had cancer. But I didn't know that those were signs that could be related to cancer. What signs? Maybe just a bit for elaborate. Example, for example, your back, back pain. Uh, you've got uh, you know, consistent back pain, uh, uh, lower abdomen, abdominal pain. You sweat at night sometimes, loss of appetite almost permanent constipation. So many things were happening in my body. Uh, and uh, when you f- feel constipated here in this country, people know that you probably have eaten some food and you, you need to get some laxative to clear it out, you know, that, that kind of thing. When you feel that you have pain <laughs> in the back, the first thing you do is take a painkiller yeah. or go to a chiropractor to, <sighs> you know, to make sure that that thing disappears. So ne- normally, some of those signs are very difficult to associate with cancer. If you are sweating at night, you sometimes think that you have a fever or something. You can never imagine that you have cancer. You think that uh, maybe you're just developing some fever or some malaria or, or something like that. So you end up with a lot more medicine that have nothing to do with the problem. And the uh, medicine that you take has a lot of bearing on the uh, whole being because mo- all medicine is toxic. There's no medicine that is good for the body. 
uh, I particularly took a lot of uh, antibiotics which the doctor gave me, prescribed for me, because the doctor said some of these problems could be by me the lining in my in the intestines, and therefore they could be cleared. So I took a lot of uh, antibiotics in the last in the three last three months before I got uh, to know I had cancer. I took many many other medicines. And at what point did you turn around and decided to give it a second thought and act on your symptoms? Because most of us, you know, like yeah. we get symptoms, but we just dilly dally, we ignore yeah. a bit. Actually, it was b purely by accident. This doctor who was treating me had given me an appointment towards the end of April for an overview of my, my pro progress. When I went to him, he wasn't there, and I was feeling very bad. Uh, you know, I, I was really feeling weak. I'd lost a lot of weight, about maybe 30 kilos in the last three months. I was not eating well. I was just generally tired, I couldn't go to the gym, I couldn't do anything. I, I, just, you know, I was sleeping most of the times. So when I didn't see this doctor, I, I was not uh, particularly very happy with him because he is the one who had been giving me a lot of medicine. So I decided to go to Aga Khan Hospital and get another opinion from another doctor. And that's when I, I was told two days later that I had cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk to us about... Uh, the treatment, mm -hmm. how exorbitant is it? Cancer treatment is very expensive, but more expensive it is if it is advanced. If it is still in its early stages, for example, if the prostate uh, cancer cells are still in the prostate gland, it can be dealt with within that environment because you can actually map them out and deal with them at that level. If you have got a stage four cancer like the one I have, <coughs> That means the cancer had grown out of the prostate glands, had attacked some parts of the organs in, 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 in your body. Some of them have found them, them, themselves into the, in the bloodstream, into your limbs, and whatever you. So in my situation, there was a, ca a cancer cell almost everywhere, in my muscles, in my bones, because the bones can reveal that I had a lot of you know, you know, cancer cells in my bones. So, at that rate, at that level, it's very difficult to do it, to, to treat it. In fact, sometimes a lot of doctors will tell you that it's fatal. Uh, many doctors in America I, I consulted afterwards told me that it was at that stage you can only be given medicine that makes life easy for you, you know, leading a, a quality life other, rather than treatment because hardly do people have that the, uh, the ability, the, the doctors have the ability to do that kind of treatment. But fortunately for myself, I got a doctor who was very, very understanding. I didn't know him before, but by the time the urologist he came and started talking to me about it, uh, I, he, 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 he gave me two reasons, two, two, two perspectives. He told me, I cannot lie to you that I'm going to treat you, cure you of cancer, because this is not uh, really possible because uh, it is very advanced. But I'm going to put a team of doctors who are going to work with me on your case, and we will see what we can do, what more we can do. But even before the, uh, we started on the treatment, I uh, had the privilege of uh, being visited. The same, same day I'd been diagnosed in the evening, I met my friend, my old friend, Professor Anyang Nyongo, who came to my house with his wife, Dorothy, and they came. Uh, to sit with me and talk to me about it. They, they counseled me. They, 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 they assured me that things can change for the better and I should not give up. Uh, the, the fact that I have cancer is not the end of mm -hmm. the story. So what they did was to give me a lot of literature that they had come with from, from California. I remember Professor Young was sick earlier before, before I, my, my case came up. So they gave me a lot of literature, which I read. I read a lot about cancer for the first time. So the following morning, by the time I was being admitted at the M. Fisher Hospital with my urologist and other people, and the doctors coming along with me, um, I had now enough information about cancer. And uh, Professor Nyongo came, kept on visiting me in every other evening from work. He passes on to, to the hospital and just finds out exactly how I was doing. So at least you had that preparation. Yes, yeah. I had that preparation. And then the other thing was, uh, like every cancer patient, it's very important that you have the support of the family and friends. Mm -hmm. And I had very many friends and you know, family members had surrounded me 
and they were all urging me to keep on fighting for, uh, you know, fight against this disease. Now, at the time I went to the hospital, there were so many things wrong with my body. Because I'd not been eating properly for the last three or four months, I'd lost a lot of weight. My blood count was very low. I had uh, very little blood in my body. I had no sugar, I had no salt, I had not many things in my body. And uh, the toxics in my body had affected my, my the kidney. kidney uh, the kidneys. The kidneys were very weak. <coughs> and uh, that, again, was a problem. Because, you see, one, one, once the kidneys become weak, and you don't have a lot of blood in your body, that means your immune system is down. That means even if you take the medicine, you may not even contain the medicine in the body because I had no appetite to begin with. I was throwing up. Most of the times when I ate, I was throwing up. So all those things had to be dealt with first before even meaningful treatment was to be done. I had to be given a lot of blood. Uh, I'd be given a lot of liquids uh, through intravenous injection. I, I, I had to be persuaded, first of all, to start eating slowly. They were giving me ap appetizer so that I could eat. The moment I started eating, then it was possible now to begin giving small, small medicine in doses. But it was very, very right. difficult. It was five months of a lot of problems for me at, uh, at, at, at Empisha. <laughs> yeah. And what advice maybe you can give to the Kenyan men watching you right now, about 45? Well, for the Kenyan men, I don't want them to go through the route that I took. I took the route that I, I, I am traveling now because of ignorance. I never knew I uh, wanted to go for, to check for, uh, for prostate cancer. Even when I was renewing my medical insurance, no medical insurance company ever thought about checking my prostate. They would assume that because last year I was fine, this year I'm also fine, and they will just uh, get the renewal. Only after you, they have discovered that you have cancer, that's when they raise eyebrows and start bringing you issues of in, in terms of, uh, you know, you know, cancelling your insurance and what have you and so on and so forth. So the best thing to do, anybody 35 and above, that's the only advice I want to give Kenyans. Uh, anybody 35 and above, you have to go for a checkup to find out whether you have any traces of cancer in your body, particularly prostate cancer. <laughs> First thing you have to do, if you want to deal with cancer, you have to conquer your fear. Once you have conquered your fear, you can deal with the rest. Because why do we fear? Because we fear, we fear to die. And let uh, what I normally tell people that, look, you can die of cancer, you can die of anything else, but at the end of the day, you must die. So why should you be afraid of dying anyway? Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is to conquer that fear and say, look around you and see how many of your friends and relatives have died. Some of them you loved so much, you cared for them for so much, and they're dead. Mm -hmm. So what makes you think, feel so special that you cannot die? And that's what, at least what made me think through my life and start talking about this kind of thing, that the best thing I can do is not to fear talking about this thing, let me tell people so that I can save lives. Even if I'm dying, let me also save other lives. Because that's, to me, that's more important. Mm -hmm. yeah. so mm. At any point yes. during this journey, yes. did you ever feel this is too much? Was, that, was there that temptation of maybe giving up and just letting, letting, letting it be? No, that was not. Uh, initially, I was shocked. I can assure you, initially, I was afraid. When it was announced for me, I was afraid. But after I started receiving counseling and talking to friends who cared about me, after I started listening to, even my fa family were completely worried. I mean, they were hysterical when, they, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I announced to them that we, you know, I have cancer. They were initially very hysterical until afterwards, that when people come down and said, look, this is a, a, a problem that we have to deal with. Uh, it is a condition that now you have, and there's not much anybody can do about it. We have to handle it with as much uh, care as we can uh, to the best of our ability so that at the end of the day, even when you are going, at least we tried. That is the most important thing to do. Yes, it was difficult. Okay. Yes. Now we're back to our audience. Let's pick maybe yeah. a few questions. Mm -hmm. After what period of time uh, does the cancer become serious? Well, it depends on your body constitution. There are people who are very resistant to many diseases. 
Uh, you, you might want to really understand that the cancer cells are, uh, sometimes people call them rebel cells in the body. They refuse to work with other cells in the body and they build their own colony. It's like a, an opposition party <laughs> in a government. <laughs> and uh, the more they multiply, the more they create more problems because now they overtake the entire body system. For example, if they have lived in your body for quite a bit of time and they have multiplied and you are not able to eat like I wasn't able to eat, that means you lose weight. How do you lose weight? Because the cancer cells begin to feed on the body, uh, on the food reservoirs in the body. And that's how you end up being losing weight because you are not taking any food in to build your body, but whatever is there inside, they eat. So it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, thing. And they, they are very pervasive in the entire body system. They move from one end to the other. Uh, they, uh, at, to the extent that at, one, at, the, at the end of the day, they have actually overtaken your body. And that's what they can take quite a bit of time. And that's why my doctor is saying that my state in which it was discovered that I had cancer had probably been there for about two years with my, without my knowledge. And because you don't feel pain, you will never know that you have can prostate cancer. Uh, you will see some signs but which have nothing to do with uh, the cancer but everything to do with any other disease. Uh, so you tend to, to treat those diseases, those symptoms, rather than treating the, 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 the actual problem. And that's why it takes a very long time for you to know that you have cancer. And that's why checking your status every six months or every year is very critical for anybody who is 35 and above. That was my mistake. And tell your dad not to follow into that, in that, fall into that <laughs> trap. And also him when yeah, he and even 35. You, when you get 35, <laughs> don't fall into my trap. Because my trap is very expensive for the family, financially, emotionally, everything. Jerry, yes. thank you so much for being with us today and that. for sharing your story. <laughs> Asante <that>. Hi. <laughs> <laughs>
maybe to just start with, tell us a little bit about ACF. What is it all about? When was it formed? So ACF was actually registered in April of this year. The background story to ACF is Professor Nyang Nyongo's own personal experience with prostate cancer, during which, because he had come out publicly, which is something that rarely happens, we tend to be really private about our health experiences. There's a lot of shame attached to certain diseases, especially the ones that people don't know about. And our political leaders rarely talk about their health status. But he saw his experience as an opportunity to share with other people because he was just as ignorant when he was diagnosed. The family, we didn't know what prostate cancer was. We didn't know how serious it was. It was a very nerve-wracking um, experience. And by coming out, he then started receiving all kinds of emails, te telephone calls, letters from other people who also had cancer and didn't know where to turn didn't know who to talk to, and were asking for assistance in one way or another, whether it was information or you know, financial assistance. And he decided, coming back from the US, that he was going to commit to improving the situation for people who are affected with cancer in Kenya. One of the big challenges we have in Kenya is that we don't actually know how many people have cancer. Like Jerry Okungu had shared his story, some people are experiencing symptoms, but they don't know it's cancer. They can't afford to see a doctor, or they don't go and see a doctor. So I think we have many more cases of people in rural communities, especially in Kenya, who are dying from cancer-related complications, and we don't have the statistics. So part of the reason why Africa Cancer Foundation was formed was to be able to do the kind of lobbying and advocacy needed to improve cancer research in Kenya, but not just Kenya, in Africa, because this situation is bad in Kenya, it's even worse in other African countries. So to get more clear information, a clearer picture of cancer in Africa, we need to know what kinds of cancers people are suffering from, what kinds of treatments are available. There are some countries that have better cancer treatment than others. So part of what Africa Cancer Foundation wants to do is also now you know, advocate for more doctors, huh? get our doctors locally trained as well. A long-term dream is to have a cancer center, a comprehensive cancer center in the continent that can serve different countries in the continent. So that situations like baby Lexi, Lexi Ajoi, who just came back home at the beginning of, of October after spending a year in India, a little three and a half year old baby, huh? Too much for spending her. a year in India. That is somebody who was fighting for her life. So for those people who are out there who have cancer and are afraid, if a three year old baby can fight for her life, you know that really it is about hope. Like we are able to keep ourselves alive if we have the hope, if we have the support, she had the good treatment, but she fought for her life. So you not necessarily deal with prostate cancer, but also all other all cancers, of cancer. all cancers. So. Baby Lexia Joey would not have had to go to India mm -hmm. if we had a comprehensive cancer center in the continent. And is it possible, let's say there's someone watching us right now who is uh, suffering from cancer, is it possible for that person maybe to approach ACF for any kind of help? If so, do you uh, maybe aid in financial uh, support or maybe counseling? ACF does not provide individual support, financial support. What we have done, however, is when we are um, presented with cases, we do what we can to connect individuals with organizations that are, are focusing on that specific kind of cancer, for example. So there is, you know, there are leukemia organizations, there's breast cancer organizations. Um, we'll connect them with those organizations. We try as much as possible also to share, to, to share people's stories so that Somebody out there who's watching might be touched by someone's story and support them. So that's what we did with Princess Rose Nasimu, for example. We actually had the opportunity to meet her just a couple of days before the launch of the Africa Cancer Foundation in July this year. And immediately we knew, okay, we're going to share, people um, were going to share their testimonies during the launch. It was a fundraising launch to raise resources to start the work of the Africa Cancer Foundation. And we decided that we're not going to have a launch that has lots of speeches that are going to be difficult for people to even listen to complicated 
information about cancer, just have people share their own stories. We learn best from storytelling, from people's personal experiences. And so even though Rose was not originally on the program, <laughs> we met her and everybody who's seen Rose knows that you're immediately wowed by this little girl. And she shared her story. And from that time onward, she was able to share her story on different platforms. And that gave her the space to you know, share her own voice to be able to raise the resources that she needed for her care. The public was very generous. People sent support. Um, she, was, she sold her music. And she's still continuing with her chemotherapy. We pray for her. We hope that it will be successful, that she'll be able to clear the cancer. What is ACF doing in specific to just uh, motivate people and give them reason enough to take, uh, to grab such opportunities? Information, sure. information. So during October, we shared information about the different breast cancer screening camps that were, were running. As much as possible, we try. We use different forms of information. We have fact sheets, for example. We have a breast cancer fact sheets, fact sheets on different kinds of cancer that we've been distributing at universities, in hospitals, at different meetings. Um, we use that platform that we have, using social media, using the media, opportunities like these to, to come on national awareness. television mm -hmm. to create awareness. But what I was saying before is sometimes you give people information and still they don't. So I think one of the most important thing messages I would have is that take your health into your own hands. The body never lies. You will know if there's something going on with your body, you will know if you are paying attention to your body. Huh? You, if, you, if your body changes in any way, so for example, the sweating at night, if you weren't sweating before yeah. and you start sweating, you should stop and ask what's Why? going on. Yeah. If you, your sleep patterns change, you should stop and ask what's going on. Okay. I just had the opportunity to go through an Ayurveda treatment program. It's an Indian natural treatment program and it's a very holistic program, dealing with your body, your mind, your spirit. All practices that lead towards balanced life, lead towards health. And so that has been very transformative for me. And one of the commitments that Africa Cancer Foundation has, in fact, our mission is to promote the prevention of cancer and provide holistic solutions to people who are affected by cancer in Africa. So that means not just thinking about what happens after I have the cancer, but what are the different things that I can do to prevent cancer? And if I do get cancer, what are the different forms of support I will need? Not just medical, but emotional, psychological, spiritual. Talk to us briefly about the challenges you experience mm -hmm. while running the organization. Well, financial challenges are always huge. We're a new organization. We're starting to mobilize resources. We're starting to establish ourselves. Uh, exchange of information is challenging. So it has been encouraging to find out that there are different initiatives in Kenya that are dealing with cancer. But one of the problems is that not everyone is sharing information with each other. So it would be easier if we were joining forces. And so one of the activities that Africa Cancer Foundation is planning to do is to create a database a comprehensive database of who is out there, who is doing what, so that even when people contact us for information, it's centrally located. We can immediately direct people to that database and say, okay, fine, if you're located in this, the nearest oncologist to you is in this location. The nearest you know, breast cancer organization is in this location, not just for Kenya, but for the region, and eventually for the continent. Living in a family whereby you have uh, a cancer patient, mm -hmm. how does that affect you as a person? What changes because you're like uh, a second-hand you know, patient? Uh, fortunately, the changes that we have had to make in the home are positive for everyone because now our diet definitely is healthy. So we eat very little meat. In fact, we hardly eat red meat in the home. So it's not just uh, my father who's not eating the red meat. We've all stopped eating the red meat. In fact, my mother is a vegetarian, um, uh, drinking lots of water, and just educating ourselves constantly about cancer. And because now we're involved with the Africa Cancer Foundation, we're learning more and more um, every day. 
So it is possible actually for a family to just pull together and turn the situation to the advantage. Yes, yes, I think so. I think every hardship is an opportunity for growth, for development, and for new opportunities. Um, if you go through a struggle, you can use that to bless not just your community, but others out there. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing now with the Africa Cancer Foundation. I doubt, maybe, at some point, if we had not had the direct experience. It's usually when you have a direct experience with something that you're touched to do something about it. There's so many diseases out there and there's so many things that we need to do to improve the health system, to improve just the situation for people generally. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope that anyone who's touched by any plight out there can do something. Zawadi, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Touch your life and change someone. Touch your life and change someone. And now to put our questions and curiosity to rest, let's put our hands together for Dr. Paul Lubanga from the Kenyatta Hospital. Karibu. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Terry is straight to business. What's prostate cancer and what are the uh, common symptoms? Jerry referred to cancer as rebel cells. They're worse than rebels, they're rogues. Under the normal situation, what happens is that a cell is created, it grows, divides, and dies. With cancer cells, the cells grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and they keep on growing. And what normally happens is that at one, at one stage, the body is unable to give enough nutrients, to supply enough nutrients, if you like, to the rogue cells. And so they have to detach themselves from their primary site to find nutrition, to find uh, the necessary enzymes to survive in other parts of the body. And so after the rogue cells realize that they are not doing very well at the primary site. They, they spread out to the rest of the body, and that's when the trouble starts. Now, if I was to use that specifically as an example to illustrate what happens in prostatic cancer, and the, the, the patient who spoke before me alluded to the fact that by the time he was going to hospital, his kidneys were packing. Because what happens is the prostate is normally a very tiny little gland in the male reproductive system. In the normal situation, the prostate is the size of a pea. And so you, when it is afflicted by cancer, then it grows to five, six, seven, ten times the size. And then when that happens is it obstructs the ureters. The ureters are the little pipes that convey urine from your kidneys to the bladder, and when they are obstructed, you get a backflow, and that knocks out your kidneys. Having said this, therefore, then one must realize that the treatment of cancer is a multidisciplinary approach. We need the primary physician. The primary physician has got the hardest job in the team for the simple reason that if you look at the spectrum of symptoms available to illnesses, allow me to use the word, you have very few symptoms. It's either a headache, vomiting, weakness, excessive uh, diarrhea. You have about 10 symptoms being shared by about 100,000 different illnesses. And so therefore, all these illnesses present the same. They present the same. So it is up to the primary physician, therefore, to have a, what we call a high suspicion of index. After I, the screening test shows that there is a possibility of cancer, one still needs to get a tissue from the prostate. One needs to get a tissue from the prostate and uh, submit the tissue to a pathologist. You see, we are introducing in another discipline. Submit the tissue to a pathologist, 
and confirm the diagnosis. To get a tissue diagnosis, you need a surgeon. There are many ways of getting a biopsy. Uh, there are many surgical procedures that allow this to be done. Now, after the pathologist has confirmed the diagnosis, then the treatment is brought into play. We are seeing more of prostatic cancer now than perhaps we used to, thanks to brave men like Jerry who uh, came out and said, look, this is what I have. One may say that, look, what is so brave about owning up about illness? After all, it's just an illness. No, no, it doesn't go like this. See, I told you that prostatic cancer affects the reproductive system mm -hmm. of men. In the African uh, society, discussion of anything uh, that, that, that touches uh, on the reproductive system is taboo. Yes, and so most men will hide. By the way, I should add that the treatment of prostatic carcinoma has come a long way, and uh, more so in the past 10 years or so. The mainstay of treatment of prostatic carcinoma, late 80s coming to early 90s, was castration. You know, castration. Fortunately, uh, the, we don't have to go, uh, we don't have to be that severe anymore. Uh, the treatment of, uh, we, can, we can achieve the same uh, hormonal ablation, and we get absolutely the same thing. Now, the other thing is that, like I mentioned, when you have prostatic cancer and you are unable to pass urine, it's got no choice but to assist you by passing a tube up your urethra to create a diversion for the urine to pass out. This allows your kidney to settle. It allows you to handle your chemotherapy and radiotherapy and et cetera, et cetera, better. That, again, was unacceptable to the Afri <coughs> African patient who suffered from prostatic carcinoma. And so what needs to go around? That indeed now it can be managed without uh, undergoing castration. And extreme measures. Precisely. As we grow older, the systems in our body start falling apart. And we become more and more and more uh, susceptible to developing cancer. Cancer mainly is a disease of the elderly. Uh, and so, apart from lifestyle and uh, longevity, uh, I, I don't think that I could possibly put a finger on uh, a specific etiological factor. Maybe, as we just wind up, at times, uh, as patients, you know, we come to you, doctors, and yeah. maybe we end up being diagnosed for something totally different. Mm -hmm. We are taken through a lot of medication, like yes. what happened to Jerry. Right. Why is it that, we, or what can be done so that, uh, so that to prevent such right. cases like prostate cancer in right. due time? Right. Yeah. We need to do several things. We uh, need to train more people, create awareness, and Clinicians must have a high index of suspicion. High index of suspicion in the sense that when a patient is not responding to conventional treatment, then think that maybe at the back of what I'm seeing, there could be cancer. Dr. Terry, thank you so much. Pleasure. Your life and That's it for today. We hope you've learned a lot about cancer and more specifically about prostate cancer. My guest today, Jerry Okungu, Zawadi Nyongo, and Dr. Lubanga. Many thanks for being with us. My studio audience, East African Media Institute, and also you at home, as always, you made it happen. And of course, our DJ, Rough Cut. Until next time, same place, same time. I was your host, Noel Amsundi. It's bye bye for now. <laughs>